Good morning, good morning. It's Sunday, the 25th of December, 2022. Shalom and a Merry Christmas to you all. A Merry Christmas to you all. Whatever one might think about the origins of Christmas Day, what is currently culturally enjoyed on the day does not constitute indulging in idolatry in any way. So you can enjoy this festive time for what it simply is. An opportunity to spend time with family and friends, an opportunity to give and receive gifts, and an opportunity to enjoy good food, hopefully, and great fun. And most importantly, to give God thanks that he has sent Jesus regardless of any accuracy or inaccuracy as regards to exactly when. So once again, a Merry Christmas to you all. Now, I confess to having a moment of dithering between a focused Christmas Day message on the one hand or continuing with our Torah Focus Sunday teaching on the other hand. And you'll be glad to know that the Torah won the day. Most of us have heard the Christmas story, or gallant attempts at retelling it for the umpteenth time for most of our lives anyway. So it makes much better sense for us to concentrate on our Torah journey, teaching through things we may have thought we knew but didn't really, since we've not previously read the scriptures through Jewish eyes, so to speak. And I say through Jewish eyes from a Jewish perspective because that is the perspective that our master, Yeshua, would have read the Tanakh from, what we currently generally know today as the Old Testament. So this Christmas day will then be a first for us in that I'm connecting with you on this Christmas day via the blessings of media technology while also, whilst also not really talking about Christmas at all. And I hope that doesn't spoil your Christmas dinner today. Anyway, my message today is seven years of plenty. Seven years of plenty. And our teaching is taken from the Michetz Torah portion, which covers Genesis chapter 41 through to Genesis chapter 44 and verse 17. Michetz means the end, and the title comes from the first verse of the reading, which says, Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, Genesis 44 and verse 1. The portion begins with Pharaoh's highly significant dreams, Joseph's interpretations, and his subsequent rise to power over Egypt. Then, when a worldwide famine reaches Canaan, his brothers go to Egypt seeking grain, but they do not recognize Joseph, who devises a means by which he can test their character. For the purpose of our teaching today, I will read just an excerpt from Genesis chapter 41 through to verses 1 to 13, and you can read the rest of the Torah portion at your own leisure. Genesis 41 verses 1 to 13 reads like this. Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he was standing by the Nile. And lo, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, two, um, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came upon a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears thin and scorched by the east wind sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now in the morning his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would make mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants, and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night, he and I. 
and each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, a Hebrew youth was with us there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related them to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream, and just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he hanged him. And that's the end of our reading for today. May Hashem bring all the blessings of the Torah upon us. Joseph's misfortunes began when he had two dreams about his brothers bowing before him. Unfortunately and foolishly, he told them the dreams, inspiring them to react with jealousy and then hatred towards him. As a result of those dreams, Joseph's life nosedived. In this Torah portion, however, Joseph's fortunes are reversed as a consequence of two dreams. Two years after Pharaoh had restored his cupbearer and executed his baker, fulfilling their cryptic dreams, he himself suffered two strange dreams, two disturbing dreams that no one could interpret. Now, Joseph's life demonstrates God's hand at work in humans' lives. Pharaoh's dream was not the only time that the Almighty communicated with the leader of a nation by means of a dream. The book of Daniel reveals King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon having a puzzling dream that he could neither remember nor interpret. And just like Joseph's story, Nebuchadnezzar's wise men and magicians were baffled and the interpretation of the dream fell to Daniel the Jew. As in Joseph's story, Daniel's correct interpretation of the dream resulted in his rise to political prominence in the king's administration. And it's the book of Daniel that explicitly reveals that God is very, very much involved in what takes place on earth. See most notably Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17. Even though it may appear to us that the world follows a completely random course around us, God is working his purposes out in the midst of it all. From Joseph's point of view, he had no reason to suspect that God had his best interests at heart. Joseph had been cruelly treated by his brothers, sold into Egypt as a slave, falsely accused of attempted adultery, and imprisoned in a dungeon. His life seemed to be following Murphy's law of um, if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. So far in his life, everything major for the most part had gone wrong. But as we observed in last week's teaching, Joseph stubbornly clung to an unshakable confidence in the God of his fathers. And even though everything tumbled around him, he kept looking to God and believing that God was working through the chaos. He never fell into depression or despondency because he believed that whatever happened, God had not forsaken him. Similarly, the Apostle Paul tells us, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Let's return to our text for today. Genesis chapter 41 and verse 8 says, Now in the morning his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh had two disturbing dreams. In the first one, he saw seven fat and healthy cows rise up from the river Nile to graze. And these were followed by seven lean and scrawny cows that rose up from the Nile and devoured the seven healthy ones. The second dream was similar. In that dream, Pharaoh saw seven healthy stalks of grain swallowed up by seven withered stalks. Pharaoh called for the magicians and wise men of Egypt. These were the people trained in occult knowledge and his professional dream interpreters. But they failed to interpret the dreams. Suddenly, 
The cupbearer was reminded of a strange dream he'd had two years earlier. There had been a young Hebrew prisoner who had interpreted his dream as well as that of a fellow prisoner. Both interpretations had proved true, and he also ruefully remembered his promise that he would mention the young man before Pharaoh. Now, have you ever wondered how he must have felt when, when Joseph suddenly rose to prominence and power, second only to Pharaoh? He must have been scared out of his skin for having neglected Joseph. But the, the nature of Joseph, I think, from what we can read in the scriptures, probably meant that he was all was forgiven. Anyway, better late than never, the cupbearer suggested that Pharaoh bring out the Hebrew prisoner and let him try to interpret the dream. It was then that Joseph, having been thoroughly cleaned up and made presentable, was brought before Pharaoh, who asked him if he could interpret the dream, to which Joseph replied, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. That's Genesis 41, verse 16. Joseph told, Pharaoh told Joseph the dreams, and Joseph explained that the dreams were prophetic warnings. God has told Pharaoh what he is about to do, he said in Genesis 41, verse 25. Well, we know the rest of this part of the story. Having given the interpretation and wise counsel regarding a response to the dream, Pharaoh was so impressed with Joseph's interpretation skills and wisdom that he made him a minister over all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. And Jacob, um, um, Joseph oversaw the building of storehouses in which the abundant grain of Egypt's seven years of plenty would be stored. What can we learn from this? Life is uncertain. The last few years that we've experienced have told us this. And our current economic stresses shout the same message. Life is uncertain. Consequently, it is only prudent to lay up savings and provisions. Contrary to the advice of Joseph, Modern society promotes a lifestyle of squandering available health, overspending and relying on credit. It's always better and much more prudent to put aside savings for leaner days ahead. Our master Yeshua, Jesus, told his disciples to lay up treasures in heaven instead of on earth. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, he says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here is the heart of today's message. Our lives on earth can be compared to the seven years of plenty. We have an abundance of opportunities to do good to others, to repent and to practice righteousness, and to give charity to the needy. However, these golden years of opportunity are limited, whether it be seven days, seven months, seven years or 70 years, the opportunity to lay up treasure in heaven will soon vanish. After we die, our opportunities to do good deeds are gone. In Judaism, the religion of our master Yeshua, a good deed like giving charity to the needy is called a mitzvah. The plural form is mitzvot. Mitzvah literally means commandment. Every time we keep one of God's commandments, it is a good deed. Therefore, the word mitzvah has come to be associated with any act of goodness. Our opportunities to do mitzvot, good deeds, good works, are limited to our lifetime here on earth. Jesus teaches that our mitzvot are like money deposited into a savings account in heaven. 
And when we pass on into the next life, we will be able to cash in on the mitzvot stored up in heaven. Last week, I mentioned the saying, you can't take it with you. And this popular adage means that although a person may be very wealthy, he or she leaves it all behind when they die. The master, Yeshua of Nazareth, teaches something very different. He teaches that by giving your money to charitable causes and investing your time and resources into the things of the kingdom of heaven, you can take it with you. You are storing it up in heaven. When you arrive in the next life, you will be rewarded for acts of kindness and piety. And just to be clear, I mean when you arrive in the next life, not the afterlife, which is when you're still dead. Joseph encouraged all of Egypt to diligently lay up stores and provisions for the lean years to come. So too, we should be storing up our resources in heaven for the years to come. Let me say that again. Just like Joseph encouraged all of Egypt to diligently lay up stores and provisions for the lean years to come, so too we should be storing up resources in heaven for the years to come. And this brings us to the wonderful words of life that Jesus spoke near the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount when he said in Matthew 5 and verse 16, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This festive time captures so many people's attention and delight, particularly when there are so many Christmas lights all around us. It's wonderful to watch the face of a child when you've turned on the lights on the Christmas tree and other festive light decorations in your home. The master says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In other words, let them see your good deeds. And taking it even further, let them see your mitzvot, your obedience to the Torah, your keeping of God's commandments. This is your light, which when shone as God intends, provokes a response of praise to our Heavenly Father from those who observe our lives. Well, as it's Christmas Day, I'm keeping it short and I'm going to end here for now. But what are our main takeaways. First of all, God is still at work in human lives today, in yours and in mine. And even if it seems that the world follows a completely random course, God is working his purposes out in the midst of it all. Rest assured that God's purposes will never be thwarted. God is at work for you and around you. And even though he doesn't come and explain everything to you, be comforted knowing that your heavenly Father has got your back. Secondly, even if your dreams are in tatters, like with Joseph, it only takes a moment for divine reversals. Be faithful wherever you are, and even if or when others forget you, God never will. Third, don't allow your circumstances to rob you of the opportunities to develop wisdom, because the wisdom you glean through those tough times will not just benefit you, but many others. And indeed, that wisdom can elevate you in a quick moment. Fourth, life is uncertain, so it's good to live each day setting aside something for tough times. But finally, and more importantly, our lives, our lifetime, are like seven good years of plenty. Whilst living, we have many God-given opportunities to do good to others, to repent and practice righteousness, and to give charity to the needy. Redeem the time. Make the most of your life in giving glory to God. We don't know how long we have, so we must redeem the time to make the most of opportunities to lay up treasures in heaven, because once we die, 
our opportunities to do good deeds are over. So today, amidst the wonderful lights of Christmas and alongside the wonderful message of gratitude and hope in Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, currently being celebrated, which also focuses on light in this season and which Jesus himself also observed, see John's Gospel chapter 10, let's truly let our lights shine so that whatever is left of our lives, our seven years of plenty, so to speak, will overflow and abound in good works. Laying up treasures in heaven until the glorious day of King Messiah's second advent. May God bless you all. A Merry Christmas. Baruch Hashem. And may God's Shalom rest on you all. God bless you.